Right, it's about 1 30 in the afternoon, 13 hours and 30 minutes into the day. It's the 15th day of August uh, 2021, and we're heading back off to my parents' house. Uh, Sunday, another failure in the project to uh, get to church. Uh, I'm getting up on time, I'm just not feeling well. It takes a while for my body to get going to fix itself up, and, and it's just not occurring right now. So, we will have to wait. Okay, we got some space to go after this. Conspiracy theorist term has been generalized to such a point that it can apply to anyone who has any degree of interest in anything going on because the level of research that they actually get done is so uh, minute that they're really missing the larger the larger picture of this, and this is what causes a larger chunk of the confusion. And this is certainly the case with uh, Lion LeBron. He's now back on the p on the page again that everything's at work, everything is uh, scripted, and whoa, they're, they're having lots of fun uh, up in the deep state. Well, uh, not necessarily. Uh, you can, if you look at the at the, at the confusion going on on the ground. Uh, the mass, he thought the masks were going away. He was hearing from his friends. That's it for the mass. Everything was done with with COVID. It's over with. Well, not so quick. We're now on the Lambda variant. The, thing, the things didn't, didn't go exactly the way he expected them to go. So now everything's at work again. Everything everything is, uh, you know, scripted. But that's not all. You see, the, 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 there is no fundamental agenda. And it is chaos and fear doesn't need an agenda. Because in more on that chaos and agenda is almost always with us. The illusion is the order itself. There is no real order. Order is the things that we describe and as long as only described as long as it makes sense to us. Our, anything that sits within our logic, our understanding, that's order. The thing is that is not actually order. That's our illusion, that's our perception of order. Nature itself, and this is what was found out in quantum physics, has no such sense of logical order. This is the way you think you come up with super, superposition. Well, what is superposition? Superposition is the logical mind trying to make sense of something it doesn't understand. It creates an order, an artificial order, in order to explain something that they don't understand. Instead of saying, oh, I don't know what this is, I, I see it, I can describe it, I can sort of somewhat measure it, but I have no idea what it is. This is true for gravity. They don't know what it is. They've never touched it. They've never felt it, really. Uh, and so they come up with a theory. And the theory is, in fact, it's simply an understanding. In many ways, it, it, it is the means of placing an understanding on something that is not, uh, not well understood. Now, for someone like Lyle LeBron, or someone reading this stuff, you know, you, you read an article in this magazine or that magazine, and so on and so forth, well, 
you're only getting the author's perspective. If you're not reading the actual uh, scientific report itself, you're not reading the 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 the, uh, the science report, you know, by the scientist, then you're not reading anything. You're reading a paraphrasing or a summarization of what was occurring. In other words, it's an interpretation of the science rather than the science itself. If you do it, if you were looking at the science itself, you'd actually be doing the research. That'd be your job. And you'd see it on a daily basis because that's <laughs> and I say daily again once again loser because again the day kind of uh, doesn't have a particular shape or form. Because the way the mind goes when you're doing research is, is whenever the ideas pop up. So if you're doing, so the, the ideas can pop up at two o'clock in the morning, the uh, the, the figuring out of a particular problem, or even looking at an archive, looking for an archive, and a lot of times you have to look at an archive to see what bits and pieces are there. Because if you can't go forward, sometimes the best way to just solve a problem is to go backwards to history and see what others are seeing. And that's the way, of, you know, I said, you, you're reading, you read the author's perspective, rather than the interpretation, you know, in terms of looking at the symbolism, the point of the symbolism. Symbolism is great for English lit, but if you're, you're going to try to sort of figure out who the author was, what the perspective was, in other words, do the analysis, then symbolism is, well, it's your own idea, it's a great thing, and that's all, all it is. What did the author see? What did they experience? That's where it tells you what's going on. That's the analysis. But it lets you actually sit down and do that work gain the perspective. This is why I go back and history for, uh, for science. If you work on a particular project, you reach the dead end, you push it to the edge, go back and find out what they did in history. And again, you're looking at the perspective of what's going on. And you're not, you're not looking at historical texts. You're looking in terms of textbooks. You're actually trying to go find and find the primary sources. Books written by the scientists. And you can find them. You can even find textbooks written by scientists. By, by scientists. I mean, in science, they have the Hertz, uh, in, in astronomy, you have the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, and then you have the Rayleigh-Jeans model as well. Uh, ironically enough, because I used to peruse old bookstores way back when, uh, before they really had a lot of stuff on the internet, uh, I used to peruse uh, old bookstores and I would be able to find textbooks by these guys, you know, by the actual scientists that, that actually uh, uh, produced the diagram or, or, or they had something named after them. Uh, and so you were able to sort of read uh, what was put together and now with the internet the way it is now, you can actually get things uh, like uh, uh, the papers from the Bose-Einstein equation. Uh, you can also get the um, I leave uh, beta and gamma. Uh, that <laughs> that, that uh, sort of hypothesis was out there for a bit. It still is out there. It's just what happens. You can bruise to it and see. But what did other other scientists think of the paper that caused? It was basically the the the, the tipping point for the atomic bomb in terms of whether or not these things would actually work. And well, theoretically, they could say, okay, yeah, it might work. They were never ever ever actually able to uh, find the equation that would produce the actual result. They were simply able to theorize and do a mathematical model, but that was about that was as far as they could go and when they, when they realized that that's all, that's all they could do, uh, they simply said that the atomic bomb was not a possibility and that that was the end of it. This was, a, this was what Einstein. Einstein did not believe the atomic bomb was not whatever worked. And I said, it wasn't the theorist who developed the atomic bomb. It was an experimentalist. An experimentalist has an understanding of the theory. But then he uses that theory the, 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 in, in terms of his experimentation. He throws away purpose and conclusion. And 
simply its method and observation. So the experimental, experimentalist's uh, uh, scientific method is simply method and observation. Uh, and doing this, he tried a variety of different uh, understandings. In other words, he modified the equations and then tried them out. And this was done. And this was the modifications occurred after the experimentation. He tried one thing, then he tried something else, and uh, this was sort of in, in, in the the notation of the equation was after the fact, after after the fact. In other words, after the uh, experiment was done the, and on the results of the experiment, he noted that so okay, maybe we need to change this, maybe we need to change that. Eventually, Enrico Fermi eventually got the uh, got the uh, first uh, chain reaction to go. And that was the beginning of the atomic bomb, and everything was picked up, moved to California and Los Alamos, that's in New Mexico, and this is what produced Area 51. Area 51 is Area 51 because of the atomic testing. It was one of the test sites uh, used for the atomic bomb, and there was a number of it was. A, it was, a, it was a, it was more than Area 51. So what happens is that, and this is why a large chunk of bunkers had to be built on the, gut, on the ground, is that uh, it, it, it still had to be built on the ground because there was just too much radiation above. So there was a necessity for the building of bases underground. Now, of course, this becomes the problem of where you know, the aerobics on the ground. It's all And the thing is, is that you go back and look at who was involved in the atomic bomb, is it, it's there are unusual things that pop up, including uh, Niles Bohr. Uh, everyone learns Niels Bohr enter, or Niles Bohr, however everyone pronounces it. Uh, everyone pronounces it. Everyone uh, knows him from the hydrogen. Uh, uh, started the hydrogen uh, atom. No, go ahead. If you ever studied the hydrogen, you're studying the uh, uh, Bohr model of the atom. Well, look at his pictures. I found them on the internet, Google them, and what do you see? You see a Nazi uniform. In other words, the Nazis were involved in the atomic bomb. It wasn't just the Americans, it was, it was the English, there was a whole group of people involved in the atomic bomb. And then all these theorists said, oh, there's, there is no atomic bomb because we couldn't get to go. And they were, they were simply looking at the theory. They were using the, what we call the classical method, of sci classical scientific method. day for a bit. So it was the 15th, August 15th. Uh, the meditation called Kimi Sisa started. It's uh, what the uh, early Christian church called death. basically sleep. They didn't refer to it as death. They either, it's either Kimi Sisa or Makirisi. Uh, happiness. Oh. And this brings us into our Conversation on control because it's 9:30 in the evening. So about 21 hours, 21 hours and 30 minutes into the day, and I'm heading off. Okay, back. Uh, so let's get into our discussion here, and this goes into doses and eventually into 9/11 and what we deal with the so-called 9/11 truthers. And they begin to understand why the conspiracy theories, while well, seeing a problem, don't necessarily identify the entirety of the problem because they don't understand some of the details. And this is it here. Like, everyone says, oh, it's a big conspiracy. There's a they up there, a deep state. Well, well, who are the deep state? 
you have to go into gnosis for this. And understand that there is no such thing as a conspiracy because while well, they may agree on certain things, they don't agree on everything. And it's in these differences that you have this sort of meandering back and forth. You have a pretense of agreement, but there's certainly an underlying current of deceit and treachery uh, beneath the pretense. This is why when we went back to you know, the uh, uh, the uh, the, uh, the Barchester trial, we went uh, we went into the Barchester Chronicles. We were talking about pretense and uh, propriety and so on and so forth. And this is what comes up with affectation. Affectation is a pretense. Now, this is the modern definition of it. Affectation is a pretense. So it's not real. So what happens is you want to talk about communists. Well, communists isn't, isn't real. These are things that are all pretense. They pretend to be people who are human, uh, 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 humanitarian, but they're not really humanitarian. It's about their whole truth. It's about the how other people perceive them. So let's get into the uh, Gnostic situation. And understand that there are a lot of different Gnostic organizations, not just one or two. The primary Gnostic or uh, organization is the Roman Catholic Church. You can look at the history of the Holy Roman Empire and find Gnosticism all over the place. Gnosticism all over the place. Same thing with the Protestant Church. You'll find it there as well. It's not in the people, but the people are sheep. They're the flock that allows the uh, the Gnosis, the hidden, the hidden part of Gabala, to be hidden. You know, you can't hide something uh, if a lot of people are viewing it. And so what happens is that uh, they use the people, the sheeple, their herds, their flocks, to hide the uh, gnosis that's there. Of course, only the aluminum flew few, this is done by ordination and so on and so forth, are allowed to sort of see any, 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 any glimpse of it. And but the thing is, you have different orders. You have the French order, you have uh, the German order, which are the Black Knights, you have uh, uh, the Order of Malta, uh, the Knights of Malta. You have the, the, the Scottish. The Scottish have their own rights, and they're not they're not all on the same page. They all are in conflict with each other. Man. So what happens is that when you say, "Oh, these are all the, the different the parties to the deep state," one thing you just understand is that they're not all on the same page, and that there are differences. There are different ways they see things, and they're all vying for their own power. No matter how much it appears on the surface to be uh, united, the reality is it's not united. So let's go into this, under, with this understanding, let's go into the 9-11 truthers and, the, and what actually happened in 9-11. And it goes about the same thing. We see things as united. In other words, most people think that uh, a Muslim is a Muslim is a Muslim. So anytime you have a Muslim up there, well, there you go, there it goes with the Islam again, they're taking over the world. Without necessarily understanding, well, 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 what group do they belong to? And this is the case here where you have to go back to your murder mystery and ask yourself the question, well, who has the motive and who has the means? And once you start doing that, things start to sort of uh, clear up a little bit and present a whole new uh, option that was really never really presented, presented before. And so let's go to this. Two, there are two fundamentally, and they're opposed to each other, groups of, Islam, of Muslims. They're the Sunnis and they're Shia. Now the Sunnis are the Arabs. The rest of the groups are not. The Shia are the are Iranians, they're Persians, they're not Arabs. And there's a fundamental difference between the two. The Shia are the more moderate, while the Sunnis are the more radical. They uh, require uh, a jihad. There's a requirement for the, for, for the Sunnis to have Shia, jihad. It is not a requirement for the Shia. The Shia are fundamentally different in that aspect. 
And so what happens is the Sunni will attack the Shia and so vice versa. Now they understand that the Sunni the Shia understand that the Sunni will attack uh, as soon as they get the opportunity to. So this is what you saw actually in Iraq. You saw you saw the the, the Shia uh, temples and their their view of things being attacked by the by the Sunni Muslims. This is, this is who ISIS was. ISIS was Sunni. The bomber, the the uh, hijackers were Sunni. Uh, ISIS was Sunni. Uh, the Taliban are Sunni. Well, who are the Sunnis? They're the Arabs. Well, who funds and who, who funds and trains Saudi Arabia? Well, it's the United States. You need to get the, get the picture. All the attacks, including the Chechen brothers, who were Sunni, were all done by by the United States. The United States had done had done its own work. They use other people, they dress them up in uniforms, say, oh look, Arabs. But if you understand the difference between the Arabs, you understand that the Palestinians are not actually Arabs, that you have the Sunni and the Shia there, that most of the Palestinians are Shia, not Sunni then you begin to understand that, that, that this conflict that's going on is a creation, it's a work, it's not reality uh, in terms of being an enemy. That this is, in many cases, Mac, uh, well, in, in, oh, sort of, not many cases, but a, a good <laughs> construction of a Machiavellian uh, monster work. Uh, Prince Machiavelli wrote a book called Prince. Uh, uh, so I can't remember what his name is. There's a book called The Prince by, by uh, Machiavelli. Uh, this is his last name. I can't remember what his first name is. And he talked about the necessity. In order to keep people who are fractured together, you need a, you need a common enemy. And they talk about actually creating the enemy. And this is what you find in Edward Bernays. In the term of manufacturing consent, that in other words, and this is you find this in Hegel as well, uh, about the, the two sides needing to be in conflict in order to produce a synthesis, and the synthesis is what's viewed as progress. So we begin to understand that 9 11 was the beginning of this whole situation that we're in, and that this is what they view as progress. So the fights that go on between co these different sides of COVID, the sides that go on between the truthers and so on and so forth, the the anarchists who bl who, who blow up things, who set fires, we saw during the election, even the J the J nine or the J six, I should say, that's all part of the work to create the friction, to create the, the the conflict. So the conflict is being created. The whole issues, the matters, are all creations, are all works. This is all part of Edward Bernays' understanding of creating consent. And what do they create? What the consent that they do? They want us terrified. They want us afraid. And they want us to believe that the government's going to come in and rescue us from these different bad things. When the reality it is, it has nothing to do with uh, the, the, the government, them, rescuing us. It has to do with uh, uh, control. But control is, again, an illusion. It falls apart very quickly because the people who you think are on your side are not necessarily on your side, or they're thinking of other things. They don't agree with the, the nature of control. And that's what's happening now with the, with, with the Democrats. You first had uh, uh, Biden and Pelosi uh, fighting. Now uh, you have Chuck Schumer and his group is, are, are joined the fray, along with uh, AOC. So what happens is that control is the illusion, it's not reality. And the thing is, it's about ducking and sort of weaving and sort of hiding yourself from the, uh, the, uh, this illusion of control.